Hello and welcome to a discussion on RBI independence. This is an important topic that's arising because of the debate about the new monetary policy committee. It points us towards two important aspects of any central bank, independence and accountability. Both are very important. Independence is vital as we will see, so is accountability. So how do we resolve these two objectives and make sure that the central bank is capable of tackling the issues that it faces, meeting the objectives that it's supposed to meet while at the same time remaining accountable to the people. This is the dilemma that we are trying to solve in this discussion, which the Monetary Policy Committee is also intended to attempt and solve. So main learning objectives in this discussion are as follows. First, we'll briefly define monetary policy. We will not get into the details of it because it's anyway part of a main economic course and it's covered in detail there. Then we will look at RBI's current policy making structure and the institutional dimension of monetary policy formulation, which means how is monetary policy created, formulated and executed in India? What is the institutional mechanism behind it? That we are going to have a look at. Then we will assess all the arguments for and against the independence of RBI. And then finally, we will look at the new monetary policy framework that is gradually evolving, taking shape and compare that with many international experiments that has already gone before. The effectiveness of those international experiments vis-a-vis -vis the requirements specific to India. So by looking at those examples, we'll get a better understanding of how we can move forward in our own country. So now let's have a quick look at the major functions of RBI, in particular, the monetary policy making functions. Now RBI is a central bank of India and it performs all the functions supposed to be performed by a central bank. These include some regulatory functions which means regulating the economy or regulating other players in the economic system. The most important among this is that RBI acts as a monetary authority in India. Which in turn means that RBI is the complete authority as far as monetary policy is concerned. It not only makes the rules, not only implements them, but also monitors them. Whereas if you think in terms of the political structure of India, formulation is done by legislature, implementation is done by the executive and monitoring is done by judiciary. Whereas here RBI is doing all three functions. What is the objective of monetary policy itself? Primarily maintaining price stability and ensuring adequate flow of money and credit to required areas. This is what RBI tries to achieve through its monetary policy. Maintaining the overall stable level primarily through controlling the interest rates, RBI does this. Now, as said before, we are not going into the details of this in this particular discussion. Now, the other functions of RBI are it acts as a regulator and supervisor of the financial system. It prescribes the broad parameters and rules for the other banks to function. And all that is done so as to maintain public confidence in the system. So RBI puts some rules to the banks to follow so the banks maintain the trust of the public. Similarly, also RBI acts as a regulator and supervisor of the payment system so that public trust in the payment system is also maintained. These other functions of RBI except for the monetary function is anyway discussed in great detail in the tablet course. So students of the tablet course can refer those videos. Other students can refer standard textbooks to get access to this. Now the further functions include manager of foreign exchange. It manages the FEMA Foreign Exchange Management Act so as to facilitate foreign trade, to develop Indian trade as well as to maintain rupee stability in the foreign exchange market as well. RBI is also the issuer of currency because it is controlling the money supply in the country. So it issues currency and also destroys currency. Both these things RBI does. Specific to a developing country, RBI also has a developmental role in which it tries to promote what the government is trying to do in, with the development agenda. It also has some major banking functions such as being a banker to the government, being a banker to other banks and even being a lender of last resort in the economy. Now let's quickly come back to the monetary policy framework and get a quick understanding of how it functions. The various instruments RBI uses are the following. Reserve requirements, official interest rates, open market operations, direct controls. We are not defining these instruments here. All of those are part of the RBI discussion in the main economic course. But some of these instruments are used to meet certain operating targets. Operating targets means initial targets. So RBI tries to hit the initial targets first. These are the short term interest rates. What are the interest rates prevailing in the country right now? The reserve aggregates, how much reserve money are banks holding? Reserve money is money that is not supposed to be lent out. And then with these, 
RBI tries to hit the next intermediate target, which is monetary aggregate, which is the amount of money supply in the country, inflation rate in the country, CPI, WPI, etc., and exchange rate, which is in the foreign exchange market. So RBI tries to use these tools to influence these targets, so as to influence these targets and finally hit these goals of RBI. So RBI has these goals, price stability, sustainable growth, high employment, financial stability. So these goals have cannot be directly achieved. You have to go through all these targets to be able to hit the goal. So it is very difficult to hit that goal and we don't know exactly how the goal goes. We can never predict exactly what will happen. So we'll have to in turn look at the goalpost which is constantly moving and then adjust our strategy this way. So tactics go this way and strategy goes this way. This is how the monetary policy works. It's a very complex procedure requiring expertise which is why it is given to an expert body such as the RBI. How does RBI actually implement this monetary policy? It has to observe the economy. These goals are nothing but the macro economy. So it has to observe the economy then create certain strategies, then employ the tactics so as to achieve your goals. So this is the approach RBI has to take. Now let's look at the RBI's policy making structure. The RBI first has a central board of directors. It also has some local boards from Mumbai, Kolkata, New Delhi, etc. In the central board, the most important person is the governor. The governor is assisted by the deputy governor. In Below the deputy governor, we have other people like executive governors. We have the central office department, which has all the managers. And we have also certain training establishments, which provide the staff to RBI. Because as we said, we need experts. So trained experts will keep on coming into RBI. This is a policy making structure. So the central board of directors is appointed by the government of India. And it is in keeping with the Reserve Bank of India Act. It will consist of 20 members and the most important constituents of the board are one governor, four deputy governors and 15 directors. And all of them are appointed by the government of India. In addition to this, as we discussed, there are local boards for each of the four regions in the country. And they are also appointed by the central government. So now let's look at how decision making is done in RBI and is there accountability present? How is the current system achieving the goals that we want to achieve? So let's examine the current system first before examining the proposed systems. So the existing mechanism is as follows. The finance minister selects the RBI governor approved by the prime minister and finally appointed by on behalf of government of India. The term is for three years and the RBI governor can be reappointed. RBI governor or RBI in general is accountable to parliament's standing committee on finance. They can summon the governor and ask for explanations about the monetary policy. So if the standing committee on finance is not satisfied, they have the right to summon the RBI governor and demand explanations. So on behalf of the people of the country, the RBI governor can be held accountable. So accountability is being maintained to that extent here. However, at present, the monetary policy is made by the governor alone. The governor has supreme authority in India. He does this in consultation with the deputy governors as well as a technical advisory committee. The technical advisory committee was formulated in 2009 to assist the RBI governor. So why a technical advisory committee? Because it's highly technical in nature. So we need a lot of experts. So these experts aid and advise the RBI governor. However, they are only advisory in nature. RBI governor also consults with important bodies like FICCI, CRISIL, etc. so as to get a good understanding of the sentiments in the business sector of the country. In addition to all these, RBI also publishes the annual report on the official website for public discussion and for transparency. So a good amount of transparency is being maintained in the current system itself. Now, this structure of the RBI makes it one of the most independent agencies of the government. It is comparable to Supreme Court in terms of independence that it commands. However, RBI governor is appointed by the government of India. So that is one notch below in terms of independence. It is also one of the most independent central banks in the entire world. Now, there are two different viewpoints about the RBI. One is that RBI has too much power and should be controlled more by democratically elected government. The question here becomes how can so much power be vested on a non-democratically selected person such as the RBI governor. So one viewpoint says we have to control RBI's power so that a democratically elected government has power over the RBI or power over the monetary policy making.
Another viewpoint is RBI should remain independent or else politicians including the parliament and the prime minister's office could order the RBI to boost money supply, increase credit etc. just before an election for example. So government could misuse monetary policy for its own purposes. Because of that RBI has to remain as a separate institution that is another viewpoint. So first we are going to examine the second viewpoint that RBI should be independence. So what is the case for central bank independence? The first is that RBI avoid inflationary spending by the government. The government might spend more to meet its own political agenda such as spending more before an election so that people have a perception that the country is improving etc. So government can sell this by forcing the banks to buy bonds so that the government can spend more. This is bad because this can lead to inflation very fast. So one reason an independent organization is good is that this kind of problems can be avoided. And we can avoid the use of monetary policy for political goals. Monetary policy is a powerful tool which, which should be used only for the goals that we already saw such as price stability etc. Not for political goals, not for winning an election. So we cannot lower interest rates before an election so as to win an election. We can only lower interest rate when we feel that the inflation is low enough to allow that. Otherwise the election will in turn cause inflation. This used to happen quite often. The election cycle used to be matching with the inflation cycle but independent RBI can control this kind of mismatches. Now let's look at the theory behind why governments might always end up misusing monetary policy. If the government is given power over monetary policy, governments have a tendency, automatic tendency to misuse that power. So let's see how that happens with a bit of theoretical understanding. So an important concept in economics something called the Phillips curve. It tells us the relation between inflation and unemployment. So Phillips curve tells us that inflation and unemployment are inversely related in the short run. So forget the straight line curve for now. Focus only on the blue curve, the initial Phillips, short run Phillips curve. Focus only on that curve and let's see what happens. So right now we are in point A. Imagine and the political parties, they want to reduce unemployment. So in the short run, if you move from here to here, Suppose you print more money etc. You move from here to here, inflation increases because money is increasing. The amount of money in the country increases, inflation increases or price increases. But unemployment reduces. You wanted to reduce unemployment so you are moving like this. A to B you have moved. So first step is moving from A to B. And what have you achieved? You have achieved lower unemployment at the cost of higher inflation. Now governments will always tend to do this because inflation is a more spread out process. Unemployment if you can reduce you actually tend to get more votes. So governments want to reduce unemployment they tend to sacrifice inflation for that and we reach B. However in the long run the newly employed people will realize that everything is now more expensive. When everything is more expensive the current salary is not able to help me buy all the things that I require. So soon they will start agitating for higher wages and we will move from B to C. When the wages increase, the companies can't employ as many people. So more unemployment starts increasing again. So we start moving back. And then in the second step, we move from B to C. Now what have we achieved? We have gone from P1 to P2 in terms of price level. And we have gone from employment 1 to employment 2 in terms of employment levels. We have gone from employment 1 to employment 2, reduce unemployment, we increase price. Then the price is still fixed in P2 and we have reached back to employment 1 stage. So what have we done? We have reached point C now which is high price and same unemployment. So what have we achieved? Nothing. Now this is not the end of it. The story will continue because again we will keep on doing this. From this again we will move up and again we will move up, again we will move up, again we will move up etc etc until inflation keeps on increasing and unemployment remains constant because this long run curve means that this is the highest the, the economy is currently capable of employing anyway. So these aspects we'll discuss, for, discuss further in the economy lecture so do not miss those lectures where we'll discuss structural policy how to improve the long run curve etc. But in the short run as we can see Phillips curve tells us governments will tend to sacrifice inflation for unemployment and in the long run inflation will keep on increasing if you allow governments to control monetary policy which is why we need somebody to control monetary policy who is focused on inflation rate alone and that is the role of a central bank. Now if you look back in history you can look back at German hyperinflation just after the first world war what happened? Governments started printing more money so as to 
pay back the debt it owed. So government is paying back its own debt by printing more money. Now then the more the money is that is printed, the less the value of the money. Inflation starts rising like anything. Hyperinflation happened. So whenever government tries to finance their debts using monetary policy, a hyperinflation can result. So we have two big dangers happening there. One is that when governments try to please the population by reducing unemployment, inflation can happen. Second is when the government tries to reduce its own debt by printing more money, hyperinflation can happen. So both of these things tell us that governments are bad custodians of monetary policy, which is why the world realized that it's important to have an independent monetary authority and that power was taken away from the government and given to a central bank across the world. And that has turned out to be an important information because throughout the world, inflation increases when central bank independence reduces. And we'll see this through data points. So how do we measure central bank independence? We have a central bank independent index in which these various questions can be asked to see if the central bank is independent or not. Political independence means appointment, etc. In political independence, Indian central bank is not completely independent because appointment is done by the government. However, government is not currently part of monetary policy formulation, so their political independence is high in India. Now, if you look at economic independence, it's pretty much high independence in India. So these are the various questions that can be used to calculate, to understand whether any central bank in the world, in any country is independent or not. So based on this, we can plot the various central banks in terms of the independence. So here you can see inflation rate increases. Here you can see independence increases. Now, as you can clearly see from this diagram, when, infl when independence is very low, inflation is very high, Portugal. As independence increases, we can see inflation starts coming down. So Germany is the most independent central bank and there the inflation is the least. Low inflation automatically means high independence of central bank. So data suggests that independence and inflation is have high correlation, which means as independence increases, inflation comes down. So the best way to reduce inflation is to increase independence, which is why central bank independence becomes an important concept. Now, having understood the theory behind why central bank independence is important, Let's also look at another aspect of it. Because governments want that power, governments have a tendency to try to take that power from central banks. Multiple times the government want to take that power because it is like a big kazana sitting there. I can use monetary policy to win elections. I can use monetary policy to finance my debts. It is such an easy thing that is sitting there. Governments are tempted to use that. However, that kazana, the treasure has been taken away from the government and given to central bank. However, government will every now and then try to put their hands into the treasure box and take some of the candy, take some of the treasure to use it themselves. And that is what we can see if we quickly look through the history of how the monetary policy committee has evolved in India. So the first step was FSLRC. Financial Sector Legislative Reforms Commission, it proposed a seven-member monetary policy committee. Now, what does a monetary policy committee mean? It means that instead of a single RBI governor, we'll have a committee of people who will decide monetary policy. So this was in March 2013. Now, it's important to note that irrespective of which political party is in power, the government will always have a tendency, a temptation to try and take some power from monetary policy. So as we can see in 2013, which is when the previous government was in power, even then the process had started. So no matter which political party or which government is in power, this temptation is a fact of governance. It proposed, the first FSLRC report proposed a creation of a monetary policy committee that would determine the policy interest rate. So there will be a chairperson and one executive member of the board and the MPC would have five external members. So there will be a chairperson, which is the RBA governor himself, one executive member and five external members. That is a structure proposed. Of these five, two would be appointed by the central government in consultation with the chairperson, while the remaining three would be appointed solely by the central government. We have two external members selected in consultation with governor and we have three purely by the government. So in effect, we can say there's a four is to three ratio between RBI and government, which means RBI will have a majority. So under FSLRC commission report, RBI has a chance for a majority there. RBI governor in addition will also be given the veto power over all MPC decisions under what is called extreme circumstances. RBI not only has a majority here, it's a four is to three ratio for RBI is to government. RBI governor also has a veto power.
द राउंड टू ऑफ द इवोल्यूशन ऑफ मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी कमिटीज उर्जित पटेल कमिटी विच वॉज अपॉइंटेड बाई आर बी आई सेल्फ एंड दे केम आउट विद द रिपोर्ट इन जनवरी टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन दे प्रपोज ए फाइव मेंबर मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी कमिटी इन दैट द गवर्नर ऑफ द आर बी आई विल बी द चेयरमैन ऑफ द एम पी सी द डिप्यूटी गवर्नर विल बी द वाइस चेयरमैन एंड एन एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर विल ऑल्सो बी ए मेंबर टू अदर मेंबर्स विच मीन्स थ्री फ्रॉम आर बी आई एंड दर बी टू अदर मेंबर्स हुल बी एक्सटर्नल to be decided by chairman and vice chairman which means again rbi is going to be involved in the appointment on the basis of expertise so we'll have a 3 to 2 ratio rbi versus outsiders government intervention will not be there so we have a 3 to 2 ratio with rbi having majority and two experts so we can say rbi is to experts ratio these experts will be in turn be selected by rbi itself so we have a situation in which rbi has still has complete control however there's a committee in place so even if the external members disagreed rbi governor will still have a 3 to 2 majority so rbi governor has still complete control over monetary policy now why is this control for rbi governor important because without that there won't be any credibility the market reacts to rbi governor so fact that rbi governor can control the monetary policy is what market reacts to if you take that power away from rbi governor the market will not be having trust in the rbi which means the market will tend to be more irrational more jittery which is why it's important to project the image that rbi is in control this report also advocated inflation targeting along with mpc now we'll see inflation targeting a bit later in the discussion and we'll see that that has been adopted so this is the urjit patel committee structure we have five people in the committee the first two chairman which is the governor and the vice chairman any one deputy governor because rbi has total of four governors there will be three external members one insider rbi's own executive director and four and five the last two will be outsiders or external members so we have a 3 is to 2 ratio there will be experts they will not be eligible for reappointment no officials from government is present which is an important feature of this proposed structure now the next response came from fslrc which came out in july 2014 they again recommended a seven member mpc but this time they are more stringent government is trying to take even more power from rbi and which is where a lot of controversy erupted out so according to this there will be three members from rbi and four external members nominated by the ministry of finance so we suddenly have a 3 is to 4 ratio between rbi and government under this proposed architecture there will be no extreme circumstances there will be no veto powers so all the power has been taken away from rbi in this final in the round 3 in this round which is why a lot of controversy came out so immediate controversy happened because this looks as if government is trying to take away all the power from rbi because if 3 is to 4 ratio is there then the government will have complete control over the monetary policy and as we have seen giving government control over monetary policy is always dangerous So this is part of the draft in the financial code the actual official language is as follows So we'll have a reserve bank chairman as a chairperson one executive member of reserve bank also nominated one employee of reserve bank nominated by a reserve bank chairperson and four persons appointed by the government 3 is to 4 ratio Government will have a clear majority in MPC in this particular structure It also proposed to take away some other powers of RBI. The so government is encroaching more and more into RBI territory here, which is why this led to a lot of controversy in the economic circles. The two biggest criticisms of RBI, which has been there for quite some time, are the following. Now, what does accountability mean? The goals of monetary policy are not clear. So, when you don't achieve something, how do you know whether you achieved or not unless the goals are clear? So, one reason why accountability is considered to be less. Second is. there's a lack of clarity of responsibility of governments and rbi so what is the rbi supposed to do rbi is supposed to develop rbi is supposed to follow government's development agenda which would mean reducing unemployment or rbi is supposed to follow price stability which would actually mean increasing unemployment in the short run sometimes because when you try to reduce inflation unemployment can go up so these are contrasting motives so when you have contrasting motives you can say i was not able to achieve this because i was trying to achieve this i can say i was not able to achieve this because i was trying to achieve this so when i give two objectives to somebody say i tell somebody to be good at maths and football there will always be a ready made excuse that i was not good in maths because i was learning football i was not good in football because i was learning maths now this is the problem that which is why we need to define the goals 
and define the direction better, only then accountability can come. The second is the lack of transparency. SS Tarapur committee was very clear that the current monetary policy formulation in this country cannot be continued indefinitely because there's a lack of transparency about goals, the lack of transparency about why it was not achieved, there's a lack of transparency about what is the thinking behind things. So they said we need greater transparency in policy formulation and in the transmission process, how the policy reaches the final goal, which is through the intermediate targets. And this has to be clearly demarcated. So these are some of the reforms required to make RBI even better. RBI is a wonderful institution which has been doing a good job. We have to make it even better. These are two things we have to achieve. Accountability and transparency. Independence is already there. We shouldn't compromise on what is already there also. How to achieve both at the same time? How do we increase accountability without reducing independence? That is the big conundrum right now. Now, what is the case against central bank independence? Let's have a look at why central bank independence might also be slightly bad. The biggest reason is that central bank is not directly accountable to the voters. What voters want and what the bank does might be slightly at odds. So RBI might sometimes be implementing monetary policy against the wishes of the electorate. For example, there could be a stagflation situation in which economy is not growing also. At the same time, unemployment is high as well and RBI cannot reduce interest rate. Instead, it has to hike interest rate because inflation is high. Now, the electorate might not appreciate that. People might start feeling, why should the RBI have this power? Why can't we decide? Why can't our government decide? So those kind of questions can come. Also, government might sometimes blame RBI for not allowing India to develop, etc. So these are situations in which this accountability issue becomes a problem. And too much economic power has been concentrated in the hands of non-elected people. Another big criticism, governor, even if it's a board, they are all non-elected. Appointed by the government, of course, but still non-elected. So how can they have so much power and independence? They should be more accountable to the people. And how to be accountable to the people? You can be accountable only via the parliament. So increase parliamentary accountability is one important goal if we want to tackle these criticisms. Now, an important mechanism for tackling these accountability problems have finally come forth. Inflation targeting has been adopted in India so that now we will have a clear goal. The moment you have a clear goal, you will not be able to give excuses anymore. So we will have a clear goal setting, which is what is done by inflation targeting. So in February of 2015, the Reserve Bank of India and the government entered into an agreement on a new monetary policy framework. What this means is that the inflation target will be set at 4%. 4% will be the inflation target. RBI is supposed to achieve that. Government will decide the target. RBI has to achieve the target. There will be a band of flexibility plus or minus 2%. 4% is the target. Plus or minus 2% is accepted. And this will be starting in 2016-17. So Reserve Bank of India will be considered to have failed if it does not meet the target. So if the inflation is more than 6%, it's 4 plus 2, 6%. If it's more than that, Reserve Bank of India will be considered to have failed. And if it's less than 2%, 4 minus 2 is 2%, again, RBI will be held accountable in consecutive quarters, if it happens consecutively. Occasional fluctuations might be acceptable, but consistently, if, if you're above the 4 plus 2 or below 4 plus 2, you'll be held accountable for that. Now, if the Reserve Bank of India fails in this manner, it will have to send a complete report to the central government giving the reasons for its failure and all its plans to achieve the targets, what remedial measures it's going to do, etc. So this means now RBI will have to be even more careful, even more active, even more proactive in policy making so as to meet the inflation targets. So this is clearly a mechanism for accountability. This gives clarity of objectives. So by clarifying the goals of the Reserve Bank of India, monetary framework has enhanced its autonomy in fact too. Why? Because now RBI can say, because I'm accountable, because I'm supposed to meet the goals which the government has given to me. That means I can be more autonomous now. So you can tell me exactly what to do and as long as I'm doing that, you don't have to worry about accountability anymore. The control of inflation has emerged as a dominant objective, which is an important item. This clarity increases the accountability of central bank. Now, to do this, we have to amend the RBI Act. So, government has promised that the finance ministry officials will be pursuing this soon. So, the, this inflation targeting has not come into effect yet. It is supposed to come into effect only next year. But before that, amendment is required. So, that is something we have to be keeping an eye on, whether that will happen or not. Now, there are some recent developments in the Monetary Policy Committee. Now, in the context of having accountability through inflation targeting, let's look at the most recent developments as far as Monetary Policy Committee is concerned. 
we are going moving towards a consensus on MPC's composition. What should be the composition of MPC's? What has been the debate, right? So we are moving towards a consensus between government and RBI. Now RBI has been saying we want independence. Government has been saying we want some power. We also want to be part of monetary policy. But now they are moving slowly towards a central point where they can meet and agree upon. So RBI governor himself has announced that government and RBI has finally agreed on what the composition of the MPC should be, which by default assumes that MPC is going to be there. The only question is what is the composition and there also some agreement seems to have been reached. We only have initial vague reports about what that agreement is. So we'll have to keep our ears tuned about exactly what is going to come out of it. So it is said we don't know the exact numbers or the exact mechanism yet, but sources are claiming that it's going to be a six member monetary policy committee. So how this is going to work is that government is going to nominate three, RBI is going to nominate three. So government and RBI will have equal representation, a three is to three ratio, a one is to one ratio, equal representation will be there. So the problem of one person having extra power, etc. is removed. Each of the six members will have one vote and RBI governor, in addition to this, RBI governor will also be there. He will have the casting vote. What the casting vote means is that, suppose there's a decision and three people vote yes and three people vote no, then RBI governor can cast his vote as a casting vote or a tie break vote. Only then can the RBI governor vote. So if the RBI governor in this case votes for this, then it becomes yes. If the RBI governor votes for this, it becomes no. Now, Sri Chidambaram says that it will be a brave RBI governor who will always consistently vote against the government. If the government is voting yes, so the 3 to 3 ratio, RBI governor will have, need some extra bravery to be able to vote against the government. So this enforces a mechanism in which if RBI governor feels it's really necessary, he can take a stand and vote for no. It's equivalent to almost equivalent to veto. However, the Monetary Policy Committee has the actual power. RBI governor's power has been reduced under this framework. Now, the inflation target itself will not be determined by the MPC. Government will determine that MPC's job is only to meet that target. So, MPC has to meet the target which is set by the government. So, now we can see a lot of accountability has come in. The target, what is your job is given by the government. So, people are telling RBI what your job is. How RBI will do it is again controlled because Partly that is again three members are appointed by the government. So government is having a direct role not only in setting the target but also in the implementation. So earlier we saw RBI formulates, implements and monitors. Now we are saying formulation will be done, at least the broad formulation will be done by the government. How it is to be done, micro formulation will be done by the RBI. Implementation part again there will be a government component to it and monitoring part again government component is there because the parliament will be monitoring this because if the target is not meeting the required levels RBI has to send a letter. So here we can see a lot of accountability has been brought into the system. So that criticism can now be removed from RBI functioning. Transparency also will automatically increase because without transparency accountability is not possible. So as we said the other external members in the committee will be appointed by the government. Now, in addition to the six members, a finance ministry nominee will also be attending the meetings, but he will not have a vote. He will be only there to facilitate, to increase the connection between government and RBI. So he'll give the convey to the monetary policy committee government's views, what the government want. So this is supposed to increase the interaction and the cooperation between RBI and government. So a bill may be introduced in the, in the coming winter session, so we can eagerly await to see what the final results will be. Decisions of MPC will be binding on the central bank. In case of a tie, RBI governor will have the casting vote as we discussed. So this is a brief overview of the new balance. Now one important thing you will notice is that veto power is not there anymore. So this veto power has been taken away from the governor under, under the current framework, which means the governor has become less powerful. Now, the power of personality in RBI is very important as we discussed earlier because markets are irrational, markets are jittery. So having a powerful figure who is able to influence monetary policy has an impact. So taking away veto might have been a bad move. We'll have to go forward and see how the market reacts in case of an emergency such as the rupee was falling and just the fact that the new RBI governor was appointed helped the rupee climb back up again, which is because the market expects RBI to take firm action. Now firm action is possible when the RBI governor has more power. So this veto could be an issue. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Now another thing we can wonder is why is RBI compromising? Why is RBI allowing three government members into the MPC? 
the reason is simple now that inflation targeting is part of the mechanism the goals are fixed the mpc is supposed to meet inflation targets that cannot be compromised it has to be 4 plus or minus 2 right which means even if government wants to interfere in the mpc even if government tries to interfere much they will still have to meet these targets which means government will not be able to sacrifice inflation too much and the whole Phillips curve problem will not be there. So having clear goals allows RBI to compromise on its independence because the monetary policy is now clearly fixed on inflation. So the dangers of losing independence is a bit reduced because of clear targets. Because the moment clear targets is there, that is a clear accountability. And because of that, even if government interferes, they will not be able to do too much damage. Now, if the inflation targets were not there, if MPC was formulated before inflation targets, then government would have too much leeway because development, inflation, unemployment, too many agendas, right? Which means government would have been able to easily justify making a few mistakes. But with a clear target, that is not possible. So important thing to remember is that inflation targeting has to happen first. Only then this MPC can come into effect. So if the government tries to push MPC before inflation targeting, that could be bad for the country. However, with inflation targeting, the current framework of MPC seems to be a reasonable framework. Now let's look at the rest of the world. How does the rest of the world deal with monetary policy? Now here the continuum is like this. As you go from here to here, central bank power increases. So here at this point, it's almost complete government control. At this point, it's almost complete central bank control. So as you can see, a lot of these aspects, do they have a special monetary committee? Is there an MPC or not? We can see sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's yes. In fact, throughout the spectrum, there is a lot of yes and no's. This shows the composition, the total numbers, how many are from central bank, how many are from external, and how many in external appointment is by government. So if you compare this versus this, we'll have the government to central bank ratio. So as you can see, when the central bank is one and the government is six, we have the least independent central bank in Philippines. When the government is seven and central bank is two, we have again very dependent central bank. However, if you look at India, we don't even have an MPC. We have only one from central bank and nobody from government, complete independence. We have one of the most independent central banks. Now, if you see Urujit Patel committee's recommendation, that would put India somewhere in this spot, which means less independence, not completely independent. However, if you go for the FSLRC versions will be all the way here, mostly under government control. So current is, we are all the way here with complete central bank independence. Government is trying to push us all the way here. Urjit Patel is saying we'll stand somewhere here. Under the new proposed architecture, we'll some, come somewhere in this stage. As we can see, a new proposed architecture will be very similar to UK's architecture, which is a 5 is to 4 ratio. So we will examine UK in more detail to understand the current architecture a bit later. Now, if you see New Zealand is having a situation in which central bank will have six to nine members and there will not be any government control at all. Now we have seen central banks across nations, there is no uniform organization. There will not be, there is no uniform targets. There is no, there is no uniform policy making structure, etc. Now New Zealand was a pioneer in adoption of inflation targeting. Okay, which became a model for others to follow. However, New Zealand did not have any committee, etc. Now, this clearly shows inflation targeting itself is enough for accountability. Committee is not always required. However, if committee is there, it is good to have inflation targeting also. In New Zealand, the tenure of the governor itself can be reduced if inflation target is violated. So that is how strictly accountable the governor or the RBA central bank is held. So that could also be a model to follow. Now, in developing economies, Typically, inflation targeting was followed by developed economies such as European Central Bank, America, USA, etc. But it's now being adopted by a lot of developing economies also. So South Africa and Brazil were some two of the pioneers in developing economies. Now India is also following in their footsteps. Now Brazil has had problems in maintaining the inflation targets because inflation is not entirely dependent on monetary policy. There are a lot of structural issues which the RBI cannot really control, central bank cannot really control. These issues are discussed in more detail in the tablet course. Please have a look at those videos to understand this better. Now let's quickly look at the other big banks, the other big economies. The US Federal Reserve has the following situation. It sets a benchmark rate which is a target. The federal funds rate it's called. It is set by the Federal Open Market Committee. It will have seven board members. It will be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So this is the structure of the US Federal Reserve, FOMC. It's 12 members and each gets one vote. There, it is not purely based on voting. It is mostly on consensus. Any persons who are having differing views will be published for the sake of transparency. 
the bank of england which is very close very important to us right now it's very very close to the current proposed architecture their monetary policy committee is made up of nine members as we saw in the diagram also we'll have governor three deputy governors and chief economists we have five from central bank and four from government now these four members are independent and does not represent any interest group that's very important they are appointed for fixed term and each member of the committee has one vote now here also the member of a treasury which is from the government a government representative is sitting in the policy meetings but he does not get a vote now as we'll see later this is very similar to the current proposed architecture now european central bank is slightly different and more complex one because it's for the entire eurozone it brings together representatives from all the different eurozone nations so there the council consists of six executive council members and 19 representatives the executive board members have permanent voting rights so total of 21 voting members each of them gets one vote each so here also it is mostly on consensus based even though voting is taken so they try to achieve consensus and that kind of policy decisions are taken now what are the targets in these various countries in terms of monetary policy do they have targets such as inflation targets what is the monetary policy supposed to achieve in these countries let's have a look in us no targets are set fomc is there they'll work on a broad consensus and try to achieve that but no strict targets are kept they'll only go for a benchmark rate in euro area ecb defines price stability is defined as close to 2% in the medium term so this 2% is held as a target mark in england again a clear target of 2% is there the central bank is accountable for maintaining this rate in canada it's 1 to 3% a range is there it's done by the government and the bank of canada in japan the bank of japan is independent it fixes its own targets it will have and the main target is 30 to 35 trillion yen in the current accounts target and japan's target is slightly different it's having a current account balance target but it's fixed by the bank of japan itself so these are some of the diverging ways in which monetary policy is being conducted across the world so as we can see there is no hard and fast rule the important rule seems to be independence has to be maintained accountability has to be maintained independence will be maintained by reducing government interference accountability can be maintained by giving clear targets now if we again look at the entire world we can see majority of them have monetary stability and other non conflicting targets some of them have monetary stability and conflicting targets now india was here earlier some of them don't have any goals altogether some of them have only non monetary stability and some have only monetary stability so we're moving from here to here if the current proposals come into effect we'll be moving from a to b so based on this entire discussion let's come up with a framework for evaluating monetary policy process itself how do we evaluate transparency of the monetary policy committee or the central bank one thing is are changes in policy announced if it is no it is less transparent is the vote published of the monetary policy committee if the answer is no it's less transparent are minutes of the policy being released if the answer is no again it's less transparent are there clear targets if the answer is no there is no accountability is there a monetary policy committee if the answer is no that means too much concentration of power possibly is there government interference if the answer is yes probably too less independence is there so these are some of the ways of evaluating monetary policy so these are all the questions to be asked transparency accountability independence now let's look at the indicators of transparency in these various places fomc ecb boc boe etc the table is there it's very please have a look at the table to understand this purely for data purposes now let's zoom in on the uk monetary play, policy framework because that is the closest parallel we have found in the entire world which is close to the current architecture being proposed so in bank of england from may 1997 onwards an mpc was formulated just like india is planning to right now there mpc meets every month to set the rate of interest set the rate of interest so as to meet the targets so primary goal is to set the rate of interest The UK monetary policy framework for Bank of England is pretty similar to what is presently being proposed, which is why we are discussing this in detail. So, membership of the MPC, as we saw, is governor and two deputy governors, which is three members there, plus two Bank of England members appointed by governor in consultation with chancellor, which is again two people. So, all this from the central bank and four external members from government. So, we have clearly a five is to four ratio, and we'll have one treasury representative without a vote, who's only there as a facilitator. to achieve coordination of monetary policy and fiscal policy so does it always achieve it will be better than without a representative so having a representative there can help coordination now objective is price stability it's not an end in itself of course but this is a prime target given to them 
Now, credibility is attained in the market. Market credibility is primarily for the market. The market has to believe that the RBI can act, the central bank can act. It's attained because pre-commitment is there. The government and the RBI is committed to a 2% interest rate, just like we are going to be committed to a 4% interest rate. That means the market will go, is going to trust more. Inflationary expectations will be less in the market. And they have a system of constrained discretion. It's not pure discretion, which means not complete independence, but there are rules as well. That's a constrained discretion is what we are also aiming for right now. Now, the government retains overall responsibility for monetary policy, it designates a framework, it sets the inflation target. And once the inflation target is set, then it's a technical issue. Then experts are required, which is why then the monetary policy committee will take over and decide what is to be done to maintain that inflation rate, to maintain the 2% inflation rate. So MPC is responsible for setting interest rate to meet the inflation target, which in turn is set by the government. So MPC is accountable to the parliament, scrutiny is exercised by the Treasury Committee and Lord Select Committee, just like we have the Standing Committee on Finance. Now, if the target is not met, then just like we have in the current architecture, a letter to the Chancellor is required, in which the reasons, what action is going to be done, etc. has to be clearly delineated. A second letter is also required if after three months, inflation target is still not be being met. So accountability, credibility, individual reputation is also important. These are all being maintained because publication of MPC minutes, inflation report, speeches by MPC members, all these things along with clear targets helps us maintain these requirements. Now inflation targeting is not a panacea. It is not a cure all. It will also have some problems. The main problem will be that there will still be differences between MPC and the government. The central bank and the government might still diverge. Fiscal policy and monetary policy might not always be coordinated in spite of a representative sitting there. So there's still a possibility of conflict. However, the fact that an MPC is there could be a good platform for coordination as we already discussed. Treasury observer who's present there will be able to coordinate even though he has no vote. Now, please note that the appointment of the new MPC members and setting of inflation objective, everything is with the government. Only the actual monetary policy of setting of interest rate is under MPC. So MPC's power has been constrained to a very small segment. Now, as we saw, an independent monetary authority is required if you want to sidestep government-induced inflation because government should not be allowed to run MP. We saw that governments are not good custodians of the money supply or of the monetary policy. So most economies, we realize this and saw the need for a separate institution to do monetary policy. So across the world, independent central banks are set up because the countries realize this. This is why independence is sacrosanct. We cannot compromise there. But countries have also, as they grow, policy making evolves all the time. So as we have grown, we have also seen that independence is not the only thing. Accountability is also required. Because accountability is required, more and more countries are now going attaining that through MPC, inflation targets, parliamentary oversight, etc., which is exactly what where we are also moving towards. So it's a correct direction to move towards. Now, Raghuram Rajan, the current RBI governor himself has said MPC is good for policy making and he has three interesting points to make about it. One is having a committee allows for diversity of viewpoints. Just having somebody to criticize you, to point out the flaws in your argument might make your argument stronger, might make you change perspective of things. So we can have more informed, more adaptive policy making with an MPC. It will also reduce undue pressure on RBI governor. If one person is making all the decisions, there'll be too much political pressure on him about what if you are wrong. But if it's a committee of experts making decisions, then the responsibility is a bit spread across them so they can make more bold decisions. So a single RBI governor might not be willing to take bold decisions, whereas an MPC will be able to make bold decisions because the responsibility is spread across now. It also ensures policy continuity. So normally when one governor changes, the next governor comes to power, we don't know what how the next governor's thought process would be like. So there could be a complete policy change altogether. Uh, next governor might decide that it's more important to be more aggressive on inflation. The previous governor might have been more relaxed about inflation, etc. However, if a monitor policy committee is there with staggered retirements that means there will be some policy continuity because majority of people will be from the previous regime so all this brings us to an end point which is a compromise solution the compromise solution should have the following characteristics it should have an independent and credible monetary policy committee independent means government should not be able to exercise full control over it a central bank should be able to assure the market that we will be taking required actions in addition, there should be clear parliamentary accountability with clear targets. So targets and accountability is also required in any kind of compromise solution that we move towards. And more official interface between the executive and the 
monetary policy committee could also be useful. So these measures allow us increase accountability and transparency, even while maintaining the sanctity of the independence of the central bank. As we have seen, that is too crucial to be sacrificed and the current proposed structure seems to be promising that. So we are going in a positive direction, a very promising direction right now. Now, as we try to drive home in all our classes, it's most important to be able to frame questions. You should be able to frame questions so that you are able to revise well and practice well. No topic is complete unless you have been able to frame good questions and practice them and revise them. So keep developing your question framing capacities. A few sample questions have been provided here. Please frame your own questions according to a metric and please post them in the comment section. As we know, questions can be static conceptual, dynamic conceptual, static analytical and dynamic analytical. Questions can come only in these four varieties. Primarily, UPSC focuses on static analytical, dynamic analytical. Static analytical is the answer doesn't change all the time. Dynamic analytical answer changes all the time. Analytical means you have to analyze the answer. Conceptual means you only have to present the concept. So let's look at a few questions of static analytical essay and DA versions. And then please practice your answer writing using these questions and post in the comment section. Or you can send it as a mail to us and we'll respond with comments on how to improve etc. So first, let's look at a few static analytical questions. Discuss the monetary policy of India. How is RBI as an independent regulator effective in implementing it? Now, the word independent comes, that means it's a clue to you how the question is coming. It's coming because of the question of non-independence arising through MPC. So you have to be able to discuss this question, defining the monetary policy well in good detail and in showing the importance of RBI independence. Here, we'll have to give the historical context. We'll have to talk about the Phillips curve. We'll talk about debt and hyperinflation conflict. All those things has to be brought in to make this a complete answer. What is the role of an independent central bank in a well-functioned economy? What are the dangers of government overreach? So again, the similar kind of question differently phrased. Why is an independent central bank required for good functioning? What can be the dangers of government overreach? We'll have to talk about again, talk about hyperinflation, debt financing, monetizing debt, etc. to give a complete answer to this question. Please do, again I repeat, please do practice your answer writing to these questions. Post in the comment section or email to us. Now let's look at a couple of dynamic analytical questions as well. Discuss the proposal under consideration regarding MPC. What are the pros and cons of clipping the wings of RBI? Here it's a dynamic question because this current proposal might keep on changing. So one year ago it could have been the FSLRC Commission report. A bit later it could have been the Rigid Committee report. Now currently we have to discuss the, the latest cabinet note which has been circulated and discuss the pros and cons of that. We have to first discuss are we clipping the wings? Is it bad to clip the wings? Clipping the wings means reducing independence. And finally, what are the pros as well? Critically discuss the importance of independence versus accountability when it comes to central bank or, or regulator. Discuss options which would allow government to maintain arm's length from regulation and still ensure accountability. So here you have to give a complete solution package. So you should be able to say the importance of independence, importance of accountability and how to do both, which is what we have done in this entire discussion. We have found that independence is possible by maintaining RBI credibility and RBI majority in the monetary policy committee itself and accountability can be maintained by giving clear cut targets with penal measures if the targets are not met. So this is a way to approach any current affairs topic. Please do frame the questions in a very, very organized and structured manner and practice your answer writing skills. So thank you for listening to our discussion on RBI independence. All the best.